Okay, I think we're ready to start. So the first speaker this afternoon is one of the prize winners, Yanis Wazidis, and he will talk about transversally symplectic Riemannian foliations and quantization commutes with reduction. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Enrique, and thank you very much to the organizers for uh, organizing this, putting together this wonderful conference, and giving me the opportunity to speak. So uh, what I'll talk about today is joint work with Yiden, Rare Shamar, and Yanni Song. And um, the, the starting point is, uh, suppose you have a pre-symplectic manifold, so just a manifold with a closed two-form. And let's assume that, that the two-form has constant rank. So it's not, not necessarily symplectic, but let's assume it has constant rank. And you could look at the, the kernel of the two-form. That will be a distribution on, on the manifold. And uh, the fact that the two-form is closed, the assumption that the two-form is closed means that that distribution will be integrable. It will define a foliation of the manifold, which I'm calling uh, calligraphic F. And um, there are various ways you could, you could think about this setup. So, so the two-form will be an F basic closed two-form. Um, another way you could think about it is that um, we have the normal bundle to the foliation, so just the quotient of the tangent bundle by the tangent space to the leaves. So that, that's what I'm calling the normal bundle of the foliation. And the two form, you can restrict it to the normal bundle and get, and that will turn the normal bundle into a symplectic vector bundle. So um, that's maybe another perspective. Um, a little bit more informally, you can think of omega as a symplectic form on the leaf space, m divided by f, except of course we know uh, that this leaf space might be very, very bad. Um, and I won't, I won't use the language really in this talk, but if you wanted to, you could think of this as a stack. And then uh, what I'm talking about today is an example of a zero shifted symplectic structure on, on the stack M mod F. And um, so you could, you could ask, uh, can we do symplectic geometry in this situation? Can we prove analogs of familiar theorems from symplectic geometry? And uh, various people have studied uh, aspects of that. And, and the thing I'm going to discuss today is uh, the question, can we geometrically quantize this, uh, this situation? So this symplectic structure on this stack, if you like, m mod f. And um, can, we, can we get a version of the quantization commutes with reduction theorem in this, in this context? And I should warn you that the version of quantization I'm going to talk about is sort of a crude very crude version of, of quantization. So it's going to be quantization as the index of a Dirac operator. So we already saw this briefly in Yan Li's talk uh, two days ago. Um, so maybe I'll go over it rather quickly. But here's, here's the classical version of, of what I'm going to be talking about today. So in the classical setup, <clears throat> you have a compact symplectic manifold with a pre-quantum line bundle. You can always choose a compatible, almost complex structure on the manifold. So that means that uh, when you combine the almost complex structure with a two-form, you get a Riemannian metric. And this lets you construct this uh, spinner bundle. So it carries this action of this bundle of Clifford algebras, this bundle of algebras. Uh, I guess we've seen this in a couple of talks, maybe most recently yesterday in Roberto's talk. It was a different, different, um, uh, different uh, Clifford module, but uh, a similar formula gives you this, this action of the Clifford algebra here. This has a Z2 grading, so there's a plus part and a minus part, this, this vector bundle. Um, so the plus part is where you take even degree forms, and the minus part is where you take odd degree forms. And with this data, um, plus a choice of connection, you can construct this uh, operator, the Dirac operator. So you apply the connection and then use Clifford multiplication to get back to sections of, of the spinner bundle. That's, that's an example of a spin C Dirac operator. So calling, using this notation here. And uh, on a compact manifold, uh, such an operator is a Fredholm, Fredholm operator. It's an elliptic operator on a compact manifold, so it's a Fredholm operator. So it has a finite dimensional kernel, a finite dimensional co-kernel. By the way, the co-kernel, maybe I should say it's the quotient of the codomain by the image of the operator, so that will be a finite dimensional. Um, and then for such an operator, you can define its index. For a Fredholm operator, Fredholm operator has an index. 
the dimension of the kernel minus the dimension of the co-kernel. It's an integer. And uh, the famous Atiyah Singer index theorem gives you a formula for, for that integer in terms of integration of characteristic classes. Okay, so, so quantization in this sense is just an integer in the end. It's, but if you like, you should think of it as the dimension of the Hilbert space of the quantum theory. Okay, a couple of comments. Uh, if you prefer, you could, you could also use this, this operator. Uh, I mean, it has the same symbol, um, so it will have the same index. Um, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, another comment, if you've never seen this before, sort of a little bit of motivation. Uh, if you look in the Kähler case and your pre-quantum line bundle is holomorphic, then uh, this index that I'm talking about on the previous slide is the alternating sum of the dimensions of the um, sheaf cohomology groups. And then it's known that um, at least if your line bundle is sufficiently positive, so in particular if you take a high enough power of the pre-quantum line bundle, that um, this, uh, this index just equals the dimension of the space of holomorphic sections. Okay, and, and this is um, what you're traditionally supposed to look at for uh, the quantization of a Kähler manifold, yeah? the space of holomorphic sections of this pre-quantum line bundle. Okay, so that's maybe a little bit of, a little bit of motivation why you might call this quantization, but as I said before, it's, it's, um, it's a sort of crude, crude version of quantization. Okay, but, but nevertheless, this satisfies a wonderful property called the quantization commutes with reduction theorem that we've seen a couple of times already in the conference. Um, so I'll just review it very briefly. So suppose I have a compact connected Lie group acting on M and preserving omega and L. And let's assume that the action is Hamiltonian, so I have a moment map for it. Um, and then there's a slightly fancier version of the index, the equivariant index. So the kernel and co-kernel are representations of G. You can take the difference of those representations in the representation ring. So R of G is the rep representation ring of the group. And so the quantization is a little bit, a little bit fancier in this case. And the famous quantization commutes with deduction theorem says that um, if you take that element of the representation ring and you look at the multiplicity of the trivial representation, so that's what, I'm, that's what this notation on the left-hand side here means, the multiplicity of the trivial representation, so that's some integer. That integer agrees with the integer you get when you uh, quantize the reduced space at zero in, in the same manner. Assuming, so, so I'm assuming here that, say, G acts freely on mu inverse of zero, just for simplicity, but there's a version, uh, there's a version in the singular case as well. And uh, you can use the shifting trick to actually get a formula for, for the full quantization. So uh, the, full, the full equivariant quantization of M will be a sum over uh, here dominant weight, so that labels irreducible representations of G, of um, the quantizations of various reduced spaces times the corresponding irreducible uh, representation. Okay, so that's the quantization commutes with deduction theorem. That's the theorem that uh, we wanted to generalize to this uh, pre-symplectic context. Um, so the first thing to notice is that uh, the construction involved the metric in a fairly serious way. So we used the Clifford algebra defined by, by this Riemannian metric. Um, so yeah, ideally, we wouldn't have to make this assumption, but uh, nevertheless, I'm going to, I'm going to make it. It's, um, so I'm going to assume, well, you should think of it as an assumption saying that the leaf space has a Riemannian metric. Um, but, but what I really mean is that uh, the foliation is going to be Riemannian. So this is a really strong assumption that I'm going to be making on the foliation. I'll, I'll tell you what it means precisely on the next slide. Um, so ideally, we wouldn't have to make this assumption, but in order to get a story that's close to the classical case, really follows uh, along the same lines as the classical case, I'm going to be forced to make this assumption. And uh, yeah, maybe before I get into that, let me mention a tiny bit of motivation. So uh, previous authors had already started studying various aspects of symplectic geometry in, uh, in this context or in related contexts. Um, so I put a number of the different authors uh, here. And in particular, for me, what was a big motivation was this work of Shamar and Lin a couple of years ago. Um, so for example, they proved an abelian localization or Dostomat Heckman formula um, in, in the uh, context of a Riemannian foliation with a transverse symplectic structure. And so I saw, I saw both of them give talks about this a few years ago. And 
immediately got excited and thought there has to be a sort of index theoretic version of this. I think I can blame that instinct maybe on Eckhart. He kind of taught me from the beginning, whenever you see Dr. Matt Heckman, you should also think of index theory. Um, anyway, so, so that, that was a big part of the motivation for, for me. Okay, uh, so, so let me tell you precisely what a Riemannian foliation is if you haven't seen it before. So let's say I have a foliation on a manifold of co-dimension Q has a normal bundle, as I already said. Um, I'll take this opportunity to introduce some more notation. So um, the foliation also gives us a least subalgebra of the, the algebra of vector fields on the manifold, given by vector fields tangent to the leaves of the foliation. And that's contained in a larger least subalgebra, the normalizer of, well, what I'm writing as XMF is the normalizer of that least subalgebra. So these are the foliate vector fields. Um, what I'll call the foliate vector fields. They're vector fields whose flows, local flows, preserve the foliation. And, um, and of course, you can take the quotient, because this is a normalizer, you can take the quotient of these two things and get uh, a Lie algebra, um, which I'm going to write uh, like this, x m mod f. And these, these are sometimes called the transverse vector fields. You should think of them as being like the vector fields on the leaf space although we want to avoid at all costs, you know, literally passing to the leaf space because it may be very bad, but you should think about it, you should think about it that way. I, I, should, I should emphasize though that these aren't actually vector fields. They're, of course, they're like equivalence classes of vector fields. But in any case, if you take any, say, local transversal to the foliation, uh, elements of this, um, this Lie algebra will induce actual vector fields on that transversal just by restriction. And another thing to note is that uh, this Lie algebra of vector fields tangent to the leaves, it acts on the space of sections of the normal bundle. This is a bot connection, essentially. Um, and so what is a Riemannian foliation? So Riemannian foliation is a foliation together with a metric on the normal bundle, on the fibers of the normal bundle, um, which should be invariant under the action of this Lie algebra. So th that's what the superscript F here means. So it's really quite a strong condition. You should think of it as saying that the, the leaves don't uh, move further or closer together. They stay the same distance apart. That's one way to think about it. So it's, so it's quite a restrictive assumption. And I also wanted to mention, uh, especially for this audience, um, that um, this fits into a more general context studied, for example, by Del Hoyo Fernandez and DeMello on uh, Riemannian metrics on the group voids and differentiable stacks. Um, so yeah, it would be interesting to know if, uh, if there are other, other contexts where uh, some of what I'm saying today will, will work, for example. Um, in any case, here's, here's a few examples, just a few examples. So the simplest non-trivial example of a Riemannian foliation is the line of a rational slope on the two torus. Um, generalizing that a bit, you could look at the flow of any non-vanishing killing vector field on, on a manifold. So for example, the Rabe flow on a Sistachian manifold, or more generally on a K-contact manifold. Um, and generalizing that further, you could look at locally free isometric action. So the orbits of such an action will give you a Riemannian foliation. I, I should say that here I'm assuming that there's some metric on, on the manifold to begin with, and then you have a locally free isometric action relative to that metric. Um, another maybe a little bit more interesting example is um, this kind of foliation that you can construct by suspension construction. So you take a discrete group acting freely and properly on some, some manifold B tilde. And suppose you also have an isometric action of the same discrete group on some Riemannian manifold. Then you can make this construction. So you quotient the product by the diagonal action. That's a fiber bundle over B, which is the quotient of B tilde by gamma. And um, this has a foliation whose leaves look like this. So n, n is some point in, little n is some point in capital N. And uh, I tried to draw a, a picture of an example here. So, um, so for example, you can recover the line of a rational slope in a two torus uh, from this construction. Uh, if you take n to be the circle and uh, gamma to be the integers acting by rational rotation, that, this would be one, one example. Okay, I'll maybe call this the Hayflieger suspension. 
Um, if you didn't have this condition about uh, gamma acting isometrically, this construction would still work. It just wouldn't give you a Riemannian foliation. So the fact that it acts isometrically means that, um, well, OK, uh, these, the fibers of this bundle here look like copies of N. And uh, so the, this invariant metric on N is going to, that's going to be what induces the transverse metric. OK. Um, OK, one of the wonderful things about Riemannian foliations is that there's this very um, detailed theory, uh, largely going back to work of Molino, although I guess many other people worked on aspects of it too. Um, so um, if you have a Riemannian foliation, then um, let's look at the oriented orthonormal frame bundle of the normal bundle. The foliation, because the foliation is Riemannian, that, if you think about it, that implies that this foliation has a lift. It lifts in a canonical way to, this, uh, to the total space of this principal bundle. Okay, so basically you take uh, uh, oriented orthonormal frames of the normal bundle and you uh, use the Bach connection to parallel translate them along leaves, and that gives you the leaves uh, upstairs on P. So the, the, the leaves of this foliation have the same dimension as the leaves on the base. They're covering spaces of the leaves on the base. Um, so this is, yeah. But we need the Riemannian condition, otherwise, um, otherwise this bot connection wouldn't preserve the orthonormality of the frames. Okay. Um, a, nice, a very nice fact is that um, there's, a, there's a canonical uh, kind of transverse levitch vita connection on this, on this principal bundle. So where it comes from, uh, just to tell you in very briefly, um, imagine you have a foliation chart uh, on your manifold. I'll tell you how to construct it locally, and then it glues together. So here's a foliation chart. Here's a transversal. Here's the, the transverse slice of the foliation chart. You can take the ordinary levi chavita connection on that transverse slice for the, for the induced metric. So this transverse metric induces an ordinary Riemannian metric on this transversal. You can take the ordinary levi chavita connection on, on T, on the transversal, and then just pull it back to the foliation chart. And then it follows from the fundamental theorem of Riemannian geometry, basically, this uniqueness property that this will actually glue globally on your manifold. Um, so this gives, you a, this gives you a connection on uh, P. So here I'm thinking about it in terms of its connection one form. And uh, it's an example of something called the basic connection. I'll come back to that uh, shortly but it has very good properties. Um, and this has all sorts of wonderful consequences. So um, uh, in particular, uh, the first consequence is that um, this foliation upstairs that you get on the frame bundle is what's called transversely parallelizable. So that means that the normal bundle to that foliation is just a trivial vector bundle. And it's trivial even as a foliated vector bundle. So, so there's a foliation invariant trivialization, if you like. Yeah, so this comes from, uh, you know, you have vertical uh, vector fields just coming from the group action, the SOQ action, and then you have this tautological uh, uh, horizontal vector fields that you get from uh, lifting using the transverse levi chavita connection. Okay. And um, so it, this, this further implies that uh, the foliate vector fields act transitively on P. So P has this, has this uh, simpler structure in a way because the foliate vector fields act transitively on it. So every point in P looks similar to every other point in some sense. And um, one of the consequences of this that uh, was discovered by Molino is that this implies that if you take all the leaves of this foliation upstairs and take their closures just in the naive sense, you get a foliation again. This is a really surprising thing. Um, and actually, even more than that, the leaves, the, those closures form the fibers of a fiber bundle over some other manifold W. And I should have said I'm, I'm assuming M is compact. I forget, I forget if I said that out loud, but I'm assuming M is compact, and this manifold W that you get will also be compact. So W is usually called the Molino manifold of the, of the Riemannian foliation. And it has an induced SOQ action, just induced by the SOQ action on P. And it also has an induced metric such that this uh, projection maps the Riemannian submersion. And uh, oh, yeah. Kind of a common space of the fabric. Uh, I mean, the, the leaves are not the fiber of the, the, 
Oh, pardon? Are the leaves the fire of the fire bundle? Are the leaves the fire? The closures, the closures of the leaves are the fibers of a fi fiber bundle. Yeah. Yeah. But could you please explain? It's very simple, but the example of the Moebius tree, the dual tree, because in this case. Oh, this torus with a line of irrational slope. So in that case, the leaf closure, the leaf closure is everything because the leaf is dense. So this W ends up being a single point in that case. And yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that case maybe. Oh, that, that, that was the same example. That was the same example, modular my drawing skills. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you, you mean this one? This was meant to be a picture of the same thing, <laughs> um, except my drawing is, uh, is very bad, but this is meant to be a picture of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the closure, so I, I, I couldn't draw it, but these leaves were meant to be dense. They're, they're meant to be dense. I just maybe only drew the first couple of iterations of, of uh, wrapping, but um, yeah, but, but this was, yeah, I, I meant to show that uh, th this construction here can reproduce the first example. If you take, uh, yeah, if you take irrational rotations on the circle, for example. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, Ah, okay, so so I, I shouldn't go. I probably shouldn't go too deeply into this. So Molino proved a number of other things. Um, one one nice way to encapsulate quite a lot of what's going on is that um, you have these two groupoids. You have the holonomy groupoid of the foliation, and then on the other side of the picture, you have the action groupoid for SOQ on this manifold W. And um, although Molino didn't phrase this that way at the time. Um, because I guess the language wasn't around yet, but um, this, this uh, principal bundle P, the transverse orthonormal frame bundle, it gives you a generalized morphism between these two, these two groupoids. So it's, um, so it's principal on this, this leg, because, well, because it's a principal SOQ bundle. Uh, it's not principal on this leg, but you still get a generalized morphism of the groupoids. Okay. Um, yeah, and there's, there's more detailed theory. So, it's, it's, so, so Molino also studied Suppose you have one leaf closure, and uh, so of course all the leaves inside that leaf closure will be dense just by definition. And so Molino also describes sort of what happens uh, in a single leaf closure, what the, what the structure looks like. Maybe I won't go in, into it in great detail because I don't want to run out of time, but, um, but uh, one, of the, one of the nice uh, properties is that, um, maybe I'll go straight away to M. So, so the leaf closures on M also form a foliation, but now a singular foliation, it turns out. Um, and you, you can prove that by, by showing that it's, it's the orbits of a Lie algebroid, which Molino also, also constructs. So I won't use this much, but it's a very beautiful theory um, if, if, if this interests you. Um, OK, uh, maybe I'll go on right away to uh, foliated bundles. So we already, I already said a few words about uh, the special case of the transverse orthonormal frame bundle, but um, uh, a lot of the definitions you can make more general, of course. So um, you can talk about foliated principal bundles, for example. So these are just uh, principal bundles over your manifold together with a foliation that lifts, uh, that lifts the foliation on the base and which is equivariant under the group, the structure group of the bundle. Um, there's a more restrictive class of what are called what I'm going to call basic principal bundles. So these are foliated uh, principal bundles which admit a connection with especially nice properties. Yeah. So if um, I want, them, so one way to say it is in terms of the connection one form. I want the connection one form to be both horizontal and uh, invariant under the, the lift of the foliation. Okay. So you can always you can always ensure this condition, this horizontal totality condition, uh, but this condition of being invariant is much, much stronger. So, for example, it's satisfied in the case of this transverse levi chavita connection, uh, but, um, but in general, in general, foliated principal bundle won't admit such a nice connection. Um, so, yeah, so as I said, this is an example. Uh, looking, for, looking ahead a little bit, um, at some point I'm going to introduce a pre-quantum line bundle and I'm going to, my assumption is going to be that it admits such a nice connection, it admits a basic connection. Okay, so, so the pre-quantum, I'm going to eventually assume that the pre-quantum circle bundle admits a basic connection with satisfying the usual uh, pre-quantum condition. 
OK. Um, right, and I, I should have also said that a, a basic vector bundle is just going to mean a vector bundle associated to a basic principal bundle. Okay. And once you have uh, vector bundles, you can talk about differential operators. Um, and there's a notion, there's a nice notion of a transverse differential operator. And um, the idea here, I guess, is to generalize transverse vector fields. So remember, transverse vector fields weren't exactly vector fields. They were equivalence classes of vector fields. So we can do a similar thing with, with higher order differential operators. So I'm going to say that a transverse differential operator is a map of sheaves from the sheaf of um, foliation invariant sections of some vector bundle, foliated vector bundle E, to the sheaf of foliation invariant sections of some other vector bundle F. Um, and then I want to encode the differential operator condition somehow, so I'll just say that it should be such that um, when you uh, look at a foliation chart and a transversal, the induced operator you get uh, is a differential operator, is an honest differential operator. So it's exactly parallel to, to what goes on with the transverse vector fields. Okay. And um, I'll say that an operator is F transversely elliptic if uh, its symbol, so, so any transverse operator like this has a symbol defined more or less as usual. So that'll be basically some matrix valued function on the co-normal bundle to the foliation. Um, so I'll say that an operator is F transversely elliptic if its symbol is invertible away from the zero section. So this is parallel to what you do in the, in the ordinary case, except we're taking into account the foliation. So the, the kind of example that I'm interested in is a transverse Dirac operator. And um, so suppose I'm, I'm in this, so looking ahead a little bit, suppose I'm in this transverse symplectic context, and furthermore, I have a foliation invariant almost complex structure. The two of these together, as usual, give me a, a foliation invariant transverse metric. And assume I also have this basic pre-quantum line bundle. I can construct a spinner bundle just like before, except now only in the normal directions to the foliation. And then I can define this transverse Dirac operator more or less as the same kind of composition as before. Um, it acts now on smooth foliation invariant sections. So I'm only defining it on foliation invariant sections. Okay, so this will be a first order um, transverse differential operator. And eventually, the, uh, maybe I do it on the next slide, or maybe a little bit later, but, but the index of that operator is what I'll be interested in. That's going to be the definition in the end of the quantization. Um, and I should mention here that uh, many, many authors have studied these transverse Dirac operators, so I put a number of the, the names here. Uh, some of the main uh, results that, that we use in our work go back to um, work of Cassini. Uh, so he studied these transverse differential operators on, on basic vector bundles, and he observed the following thing. So, um, First of all, if you have a basic vector bundle over here on M, there's a way to kind of transfer it uh, across this Molino diagram to get a vector bundle on W. So what you do is you, uh, you take the vector bundle on M, you pull it back to P, and then you take the space of um, foliation and variant sections of that pulled back vector bundle on P. So you form this... Um, this module, so this is a module over uh, foliation and variant smooth functions on P. You form this module, and then because um, foliation variant smooth functions on P is just the same thing as smooth functions on W, that's basically how we construct, that's one way you can describe W as, if you like, the, the sorry, the, the spec of this algebra, if you like. Um, what you, get, what you get is some, uh, some module over smooth functions on W, and then you check that it's um, that it defines for you a locally free, finitely generated sheaf, and so you get a vector bundle on W, and that's what I'm calling E sub W. So this, this uh, module is the space of sections of some vector bundle that I'm calling E sub W. In general, E sub W could have strictly lower rank than E. Sometimes it has the same rank, but it, it's possible for it to, there are examples where it has strictly lower rank. But anyways, it's some vector bundle on, on W. And um, this actually defines a functor from vector bundles here to vector bundles here. Sorry, basic vector bundles here to SOQ equivariant vector bundles here. And um, 
there's a similar kind of transfer operation for differential operators. So if you have a transverse differential operator here acting on some vector bundles, you can lift it and then descend it to get a, vector, to get a transverse differential operator on this vector bundle over W. Okay, so all of this works very, very nicely. And the construction, so, so that's what I'm calling D sub W, the transfer differential operator. And the construction is such that if you take this transfer differential operator and you restrict it to the SOQ invariant sections of these vector bundles on W, you recover um, the original operator under, under this identification. So the construction is such that uh, foliation invariant sections of your vector bundle E are just exactly the same as are canonically identified with SOQ invariant sections of this vector bundle on W. And so under that identification, these, um, these operators correspond to each other. Okay, so this is very nice. It means you can transfer various properties about uh, sorry, various questions about transverse differential operators on M to questions on, on, uh, about um, operators on W. And another thing that Cassimi observed is that um, this correspondence takes F transversely elliptic operators to SOQ transversely elliptic operators. So there's this some um, theory of SOQ transversely elliptic operators uh, going back to a TIA that's um, very well developed, very nice. Um, and so this correspondence you can use to uh, uh, turn several questions, lots of questions about F transversely elliptic operators into questions about SOQ transversely elliptic operators. In particular, uh, the index of an F transversely elliptic operator is well defined because, uh, for example, Atia proved that um, the SOQ invariant part of the index of uh, an SOQ transversely elliptic operator is, is well defined, is the kernel and co-kernel are finite dimensional. Um, so, um, I, so, so the index makes sense. It makes sense to define it this way. Both of these integers are finite. And um, the, the resulting index is actually the same, just the same as the index of this operator on, on W. Okay. So all of this was, um, was known for a long time. And, and so this is going to be my definition of the quantization of this, uh, of this uh, manifold with transverse symplectic structure. Yeah, I'm just going to define it to the index of this transverse Dirac operator. Um, okay, one thing you might ask is, is this, is this definition Morita invariant or is it invariant under weak equivalence? Uh, that's a natural, maybe natural question to ask, especially if you're thinking of stacks. Um, so first of all, uh, weak equivalence is, is for foliations is, is fairly easy to describe. So, so a weak equivalence of foliations um, just means that you have a, a manifold here in the middle with surjective submersions with connected fibers onto the two, um, onto the two manifolds, foliated manifolds that you want to compare, um, such that uh, the pullbacks of the foliations are the same. Yeah, so the, by, by pullback of the foliation, I just mean take each of the leaves and take its inverse image under the projection. And uh, those two foliations should coincide on M. Okay, so that's what I mean by weak equivalence. And uh, this immediately implies that you get an isomorphism between the normal bundles, the pullbacks of the normal bundles of these foliations. So, for example, this means that you can compare lots of structures uh, on the normal bundles. So, for example, you can immediately make sense of what it means for a Morita equivalence to intertwine two symplectic structures. You just say that the pullbacks of the transverse symplectic forms are, are equal to each other. Okay, and then, um, a th and then one, of our, one of our results says that this definition is Morita invariant under, under suitable uh, notion, suitable, um, so you need your Morita equivalents to preserve uh, the structures involved. So suppose you have two sets of all of these data that I've been talking about, so uh, manifold, foliation, transverse symplectic structure, invariant, uh, 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 almost complex structure in the normal bundle, um, the corresponding uh, invariant transverse Riemannian metric, pre-quantum line bundle. Okay, let me just from now on call this quantizing data. Suppose you have all of these structures on two manifolds like this, and, um, and let's say you have a symplectic uh, weak equivalence. I also want to assume that this manifold in the middle, middle is compact because uh, I was assuming that M1 and M2 are compact, so I want the M in the middle to be compact as well. Um, then uh, the quantizations are the same. Okay, so this notion is invariant under some some version of Morita equivalence. 
OK, so then the next thing I want to move towards is to talk about a quantization commutes with reduction theorem. So um, here I'm just reminding you of some things I defined before. So, um, uh, so I had this notation for the foliate vector fields. So these are the vector fields that uh, preserve, whose flows preserve the foliation. And the quotient of these, I remind you, um, is what I called uh, transverse vector fields. These aren't really vector fields. They're fact equivalence classes of vector fields. But um, anyways, you should think of these as vector fields on the, on the quotient informally. Um, inside this Lie algebra, so this is a Lie algebra, uh, inside this Lie algebra, you have a subalgebra of transverse killing vector fields. So these are the ones that preserve the metric. So a transverse action of a Lie algebra uh, transverse isometric action of a Lie algebra, or transverse killing action, I guess I'm calling it here, is just a Lie algebra homomorphism from the Lie algebra into the transverse killing vector fields. Okay. So this, this means in particular that if you take any, say, local transversal to the foliation, you'll get an honest action of the Lie algebra by, by killing vector fields. Okay. Uh, we, don't, we don't require, so you could ask, does this map lift to actual vector fields? on the manifold up to, uh, up to here, for example. We don't require that. And I, I believe it's probably not guaranteed to, to exist. Um, OK, so I have this Lie algebra. Let me define R of G. So R of capital G before was a representation ring. So now I'm just going to, I only have a Lie algebra here. So I'm just going to define this to be uh, basically the representation ring of the Lie algebra. But, but more precisely, I'm only allowing um, things that are direct sums of irreducible representations. Okay, I don't allow in, de in decomposable uh, representations. Um, okay, so this is what I mean by the representation ring. It's a ring as usual with just direct sum and tensor product as the operations as usual. And uh, if you assume all this data is G equivariant, then you have an equivariant index defined similar to the ordinary setting. And that will be an element of this, of this representation ring. And um, maybe I should mention that secretly in the background, um, there, there's some non-trivial things that we're using here. So, um, so it turns out that um, if you have a transverse action of a Lie algebra like this on M, on this compact manifold, foliated manifold M, it induces an action of, of the same Lie algebra on the Molino manifold W, this compact Riemannian manifold W. And it turns out it would be uh, an isometric action. And, um, and that's secretly in the background, making, uh, making sure that this, that this makes sense, that, for example, no indecomposable representations could appear here. Because in the end, in the end there's some compact group in the background. Um, but anyways, um, this is our definition of the equivariant uh, quantization in the case of a transverse action. And so then you can sort of follow your nose. So you can introduce a notion of a Hamiltonian action. So this is an action for which there is a moment map. So I just wrote down the moment, the usual exact ordinary moment map condition. It makes sense. And, and um, the next thing is to talk about reduced spaces. Reduced spaces are one thing that actually become a little bit simpler in this context because we don't need to divide out by the group action anymore. We can just build that into the foliation, if you like. So if I, if I have a regular value for my moment map, uh, then I'm just going to define the reduced space in this transversely symplectic world to be just the fiber of zero. Um, and then I'll, uh, to compensate, I'll, I'll enlarge the foliation. So I'll take the larger foliation generated by the original foliation, restricted to the zero fiber, uh, together with the G action. So the, the fact that zero is a regular value here will mean that this is, again, a foliation with larger leaves. The leaves have gone up in dimension by the dimension of the Lie algebra. And uh, that, that will give me this enlarged foliation of mu inverse of zero. And then, yeah, the transverse symplectic form is just the restriction. Okay, so, so symplectic reduction actually gets easier in, in a way. That's, um, that's kind of nice. And then, and then here's, here's our main result. So our main result is a quantization commutes with reduction theorem in this context. So um, saying that if you take the multiplicity of the trivial representation in the equivariant quantization, that equals the quantization of this reduced space. And I put, so we accumulated some assumptions along the way, which I tried to summarize up here. Um, maybe one assumption I didn't mention yet is that um, at this stage, I need to assume that this Lie algebra admits a, an invariant positive definite inner product. And I'll explain why in a second, but 
Um, this is basically has to do with the, the, the strategy of proof. Um, and as usual, uh, so the shifting trick also, also makes sense in this context. And so um, you, get, you get a formula for the whole equivariant quantization. OK, so maybe I'll say a tiny bit about the idea of proof. So um, we, we adapted a strategy that goes back to polymial paradan in the classical setting. Um, so I'll tell you a, a tiny bit about how that works. So, so the idea is you take, you take the moment map. Uh, well, let, 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 let's consider this composition. So you have the moment map to go to G star. You use the invariant inner product, positive definite inner product on the Lie algebra to go to G. That gives you an isomorphism from G star to G. And then you apply the action to get a vector field, well, really, in this case, a transverse vector field on, on the manifold. In paradigm setting, it was an honest vector field. Here, it's a transverse vector field. So this is what you might call the transverse Kerr 1 vector field. And then, according to paradigm, you should use the, the Kerr 1 vector field to deform the symbol of the Dirac operator. So that's what I'm doing here. I take the symbol of this uh, transverse Dirac operator, and I deform it by um, the Kerr 1 vector field. Um, and um, you can consider this as a family of uh, now G uh, semi-direct product F transversely elliptic symbols. So here, uh, maybe, can I zoom in? Oh, I can. Okay, it takes some time to update, but okay. There's, there's a larger, I didn't mention this before, but there's a larger Lie algebraoid around that encodes both the foliation and the action simultaneously. So that's what I'm calling G semi-direct product F. Um, the vector bundle is just a fiber product like this. You have maps from the action map from uh, the Lie algebra to the normal bundle, and you also have a quotient map from the tangent bundle to the normal bundle. You form the fiber product. Um, that turns out to be a Lie algebraoid that encodes both the foliation and the action. And um, in, in a natural sense that I didn't write down the definition of, but um, you can probably imagine what the definition looks like, you can think of this family of symbols as being transversely elliptic for this Lie algebraoid. Okay. And, um, and so where, where uh, the, the new work that we did comes in is that uh, we, we did some work to develop the theory of such transversely elliptic symbols and prove analogs of lots of the properties that, um, that Atiyah proved for ordinary uh, transversely elliptic symbols in this, in this new context for this new Lie algebraoid. Um, and in particular, one of the things, one of the um, results that you can prove uh, with this uh, machinery is you can prove what's called a non-abelian localization formula or sometimes norm square localization formula. So um, when you deform this, this symbol in, in the space of transversely elliptic symbols, um, uh, the index ends up breaking up into a sum of contributions from the different uh, connected components of the vanishing locus of this Kerr 1 vector field. Okay. Um, one, one interesting thing about this formula is that um, this, uh, this left-hand side is a finite dimensional representation of this Lie algebra G. Um, or, or really, or, sorry, it's an element of the representation ring, so maybe a formal difference of such. Um, the contributions on this right-hand side here can, in general, be infinite dimensional, but they have finite, finite multiplicities. Okay? Each irreducible representation has a finite multiplicity. And, and typically what happens is that um, there's a bunch of cancellation on the right-hand side here um, so that you end up with something finite, finite dimensional in the end. Okay? But the individual, individual contributions are typically um, infinite dimensional. Okay, and then following Pardan, and I'm not going to go into more detail on this because it takes a bit too much time, but um, you get the quantization commutes with reduction theorem by studying the terms in this formula. So most of the terms, it turns out, don't contribute to the multiplicity of the trivial representation, except for one. Um, the one that contributes is the one corresponding to the zero fiber of the moment map, and that ends up and maybe predictably being related to the quantization of the reduced space. Okay. Um, and there, there are, maybe I should say, there are some kind of twists and turns uh, in the story here. So our first guess, or at least my first guess, when I started thinking about this problem was, oh, you'll just pass the Molino manifold and do non-abelian localization there. Uh, that doesn't quite work. I probably don't have time to explain why, but, um, but that, that ends up not giving you the right, the right formula. 
Um, OK, I think the rest of the talk, I'll just talk about some examples, give you some examples. So the first set of examples um, are what are called Tor quasifolds. So this, this definition goes back to Elisa Prato. Um, and you can construct these things very much like the classical Dalzant construction. So um, I, I'll describe that uh, briefly. Probably, um, probably everyone's seen that before. I think I'm even us using mostly the same notation as in Anacanas de Silva's book here. So, so you can really um, you can tune out if you're very familiar with this. Um, so I take a, a finite dimensional real vector space that I'm calling a Gothic T or Fractor T. And then I want to, I want to choose a simple polytope in that vector space uh, specified by some uh, inequalities like this. I'm going to assume that these, these constants ci are integers. And then I, have these, I also have these normal vectors, non-zero normal vectors, v sub i. Um, and normally in the Delzant construction, you make some further assumptions about these normal vectors, for example. But here we don't, we don't need to. So in Elisa Prato's construction, uh, you, don't, you don't make these additional Delzant uh, assumptions. So here I just I have some, uh, some non-zero normal vectors. And then there's, there's a map. These vectors give you a map from r to the power d to um, this, this finite dimensional real vector space t, where you just take the standard basis elements and map them to the chosen normal vectors. And um, so this map will be um, surjective. And uh, it will have some kernel. And normally, in the Delzant construction, this kernel would have to be a rational subspace. But here, I didn't put any assumptions on these vi, so this need not be a rational subspace. So I'm kind of using Gothic lettering uh, because these will be, these will be Lie algebras. Um, but, uh, but, but for example, this, this Lie algebra need not integrate to a nice closed subgroup as it would in the ordinary Delzant construction. Okay, so we get these exact sequences. Just by definition, we get these exact sequences like this. Um, and then the next step in the Delzant construction is you, um, you start with c to the power d with its standard momentum map. So I guess this would be the standard momentum map. And you can also have a shift. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm going to shift by this uh, vector of constants here that uh, appeared in the definition of the polytope on the previous slide. So this is, this is the moment map. The moment map image looks something like this, this kind of shifted orthant. And uh, then you're supposed to partially reduce this. According to Delzant, you're supposed to partially reduce this. So I look at the induced moment map for the H action, for the action of H, of the Lie algebra H. So the moment map for that action is just the composition of phi with a projection onto H star. And then I reduce for that action. So in this uh, transversely symplectic world, that means I should just take the fiber of zero. Okay. And then the foliation will be the H orbits. And normally in the Delzant construction, this would integrate to a nice closed uh, subtorus. And so you could actually take the quotient here by, by the, the subtorus H. But here I'm not assuming that. So I just have a foliation given by these H orbits. And that's, that's going to be the transversely symplectic manifold that I consider. And it carries a residual um, Hamiltonian T action, just left over from the original uh, U1 to the D action on, on C to the power D. Uh, and the moment map for that action is just given by, by this formula. Okay? And its image will be exactly this, this polytope. Okay? So, in, so in this picture, uh, what I'm drawing in this picture is uh, originally, phi has this moment map image that looks like this shifted orthant. And then we intersect it with this, this subspace T star. And uh, this will be uh, a kind of embedded copy of, of this polytope delta. OK. And uh, there's a natural pre-quantum line bundle here. So because I chose these, uh, these numbers to be integers, these constants to be integers, um, we get an action of u1 to the d uh, having that uh, as a weight. And this is, this is the natural pre-quantum line bundle to use on c to the d if you use, uh, if you use um, the phi on the previous page as your moment map. Okay? That satisfi this satisfies the constant condition. And if you just restrict this uh, line bundle to m, I mean, it's trivial, topologically trivial, but it has a non-trivial action. If you restrict this to m, you get a pre-quantum line bundle on m. And then you can calculate what the quantization is, and it, it, it is more or less what you would, what you would expect. So I wrote kind of two dis different descriptions of this. 
but it's basically you sum over the lattice points in the polytope of the corresponding uh, representations uh, for those lattice points. So now this, this, this is maybe what you would expect, except now our polytope is not, doesn't necessarily have the usual nice properties that it does in the Dalzant case. But still, the quantization is the same kind of thing. You just count lattice points in the, in the polytope. OK. Um, here's another example. How, how much time do I have left, by the way? Five minutes? OK, perfect. Yeah, so here, here's another example. So to go back to this Hayfliger suspension, suspension example. So in this case, because, I, because everything is constructed from data on n, so the symplectic form will be on n, the metric will be on n, you'd, you'd expect, or at least I would expect, that the quantization would be completely describable in terms of data on n. And that, that's the case. That's true, as you would expect. Um, so um, it doesn't take much work to check that um, this quantization ends up just being the index of an operator on n. So what you do is you take the, the Dirac operator on n, constructed in the way that, that I talked about earlier. You let it act on the space of smooth gamma invariant sections. So gamma, remember, was this discrete group acting isometrically on n. You just restrict this operator to the space of smooth gamma invariant sections. That's a Fredholm operator, so it has an index. And, uh, and this, that index ends up coinciding with this index that I defined in a slightly different way. Um, on, on this, uh, this Hayfliger suspension foliation. Okay. And, and maybe another remark, if you specialize even further and you assume that this discrete group action on N is free and proper, then um, our theorem reduces to the classical QR equals zero theorem applied to this quotient N mod gamma, this smooth manifold N mod gamma. Okay. okay. Um, and maybe the last example I'll talk about is the the k-contact case, or you could specialize a bit further to the Sasakian case if you like. So uh, in this setting, so let's say I have a contact manifold with a contact one form theta. You can look at the rib, the orbits of the rib vector field, and the k-contact assumption means that um, that those rib orbits will form a Riemannian Riemannian foliation. Okay. So this fits into our setting. So I can assume, assume I have the other data that, that I talked about earlier. So, so let's say for simplicity in this case that I actually have a group, a compact connected group acting on my manifold M. I suppose you could, you could also just consider transverse actions like before, but um, it's already interesting if, if I assume that I have a compact connected Lie group acting on M with a moment map um, in, the, in, in this sense. So the, the moment map uh, looks like this. And, uh, oh, here, here, this is the center of the Lie algebra, the dual of the center of the Lie algebra. You can always shift. Uh, this is kind of the ordinary moment map that you'd write down, and you can always shift by a central element. Um, then uh, our theorem specializes to a QR equals zero result for, for contact manifolds. I'm not sure, yeah. Um, so so there, there were some authors who, 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 um, who studied uh, other versions of QR equals zero for contact manifolds. We're not 100% sure the relationship of what we're doing to what they're doing, at least not yet. Um, but in any case, we get, we get some uh, QR equals zero result for, for contact manifolds. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I'll, I think I'll stop there. Are there questions for Yanis? So I'm wondering, um, as I understand, uh, the core of your approach is Molino's uh, theory. And uh, one way to think about it is, as you indicated in the diagram, as a generalized map from the holonomy groupoid to the action groupoid. Mm -hmm. um, I can go back to it is about unraveling the, these leaf spaces, which are pretty bad, but encoding them in more smooth, into more smooth data. And one intermediate step in Molino's theory is that of transversally parallelizable foliations, which if I remember correctly, in that case, you don't have to go to the frame bundle. So already there, you, then at that level, you can take leaf closures. And what you get is a W. 
and somehow morally you have a tangent bundle of the leaf space which a transitive algebraic over it, which comes from your transversal vector fields, but now interpret it as a vector field over W. So I'm wondering, that, is that a symplectic algebraid? Do you know? Because oh, morally it's, it's, it's about the leaf space being symplectic. Oh, right? In, in your situation, when you have omega, and it, omega, morally it's a symplectic structure on the leaf space. Uh -huh. So I'm saying uh -huh. if you pass to the Molino's transitive Lie algebra or W in the transversal parallel case, do you get a asymplectic, an algebraic symplectic structure uh, on that Lie algebra? Do you know? Oh, I think I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, th I think you probably would. So you're saying, you're saying uh, suppose you have a transversely symplectic and also transversely parallelizable foliation. And um, would you get a Lie algebraid uh, symplectic form? I think you would. I think you would. Because I, I, I kind yeah. of guess you would, but then it means that the proof should be much easier. I mean, you you feel you fall within the kind of singular symplectic spaces which are modeled by symplectic algebraids. So, in particular, you should be able in that case to do even deformation quantization in the Fedosov style. So, I'm wondering whether you does your approach simplify a lot in the transversally parallelizable case or not? Maybe oh, that's, that's the way to put my question. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, haven't, I haven't thought about it, yeah, but that's, yeah, that's a good remark. Um, yeah, per perhaps, perhaps, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um. Any other question? Uh, I'm just curious, uh, can you also define the total class and uh, uh, recover this, uh, the similar Atiyah Singer uh, index formula in your setting? Uh, oh, um, no, that's one thing I would say I don't know how to do. So, uh, do I have this up here? So, um, somewhere I had the slide with the list of, uh, oh, it's probably, sorry to go around. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's something I wouldn't, I don't know how to do. Um, so, so, so some of these authors in the list here, in particular, Brennan Camber, Richardson, and uh, Gorkovsky a lot, um, they, so uh, they have somewhat more recent work, I guess from about 10, 12 years ago or so, um, where they got some kind of formula for the index of a transverse Dirac operator. Uh, but but no toad yeah. class or, they uh, have toad class or not? Oh, um, I, the short answer is I don't, I don't know. Their formula is more complicated than the ordinary case. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, but, but that's something, I think that's something uh, interesting, well, definitely interesting to. So maybe uh, reinforcing uh, what Marius was saying, um, in your uh, approach, the metric that you have, the transverse metric, doesn't really play any role in the proof or in the result, right? The transverse metric? Yeah, the, you, have the remaining fo you have a remaining foliation, so it has a metric. But that metric doesn't really play any role in the, in the theorem. Um, if, if you mean in the sense that uh, the result is independent of the metric. If you exactly. Exclude. Yeah, okay, yes. And you don't use it really the metric. What you use is the properties of the foliation. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's So fair. I think that goes a bit in the direction of what Marius was saying. Ah, okay. Just my comment. Okay. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Um, yeah, but uh, but but we are using a lot of this this Molino theory. I, yeah, I wouldn't. I think it's very interesting to to ask. Uh, yeah, whether some of this could be generalized to a larger class of foliations or maybe larger class of groupoids. Um, yeah, it's definitely something I'm interested in thinking about in the future. But I suspect it would take more radical. Uh, revisions of the kind of classical uh, QR equals zero story. Uh, for maybe in the direction of non-commutative geometry, there's, there's this interesting work by Con Moscovici, Con, Con Scandales, for example, about transversely elliptic operators on more, much more general foliation. So 
maybe that has something to say. I'm not sure. I'm just curious, why did you stick to indices and not more uh, yeah, full geometric quotation? Oh, uh, well, uh, I would say really we wanted to prove a QR equals zero theorem, so um, we, we focused our attention on that. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there are other, other interesting things to, to think about as well. Yeah. I mean, to, to some extent, we, we think about the QR equals zero theorem as really a, a, a theorem in index theory, to some extent. I mean, maybe originally inspired by ideas from symplectic geometry, but, um, but in the end, it's some theorem about index theory, so. <laughs> no, uh, the proper Lie group is admitted a compatible metric, no? So these are foliations with a metric. And I think a flaum uh, post to Mantang have some transverse uh, index theory in the case of proper groupoids. Uh, and I was wondering whether if they are related, uh, this result with uh, their work. Probably. Uh, I, I don't think I'm qualified to, to answer, but uh, I don't know if possibly Yan Li has, some, has a comment about that. Or, yeah, I, I'm not sure, but, but I, would guess, I, would guess, uh, I would guess that they would have something in common. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that's another direction I'm kind of interested in thinking in the future. So, so I mentioned, I mentioned these uh, G semi-direct F transversely elliptic operators. I think, kind of suggests a question, uh, you know, for what Lie algebraids can you uh, study? Does it make sense? Do you have a good theory of transversely elliptic operators? And maybe, yeah. So, so this G semi-direct F is not a proper example, but. Uh, maybe it's sort of close enough to being proper that you can still make things work, and maybe there's a good class of Lie algebras that are close enough to being proper that you can do something. Um, yeah. So if there are no more question, questions, let's thank Yanis again. Uh, let's have a 10-minute break, so 10 minutes. <laughs>